All right, so while you're uploading things from last time, I'm going to jump right into 3.2 and kind of remind you what we had done and where we are. Um, and 3.2, we're talking about zeros of polynomial functions. And we had looked at the operation of synthetic division and how that worked. Um, in particular, synthetic division, we looked at it in two different ways. We looked at it from the perspective of being given a x minus 4 as a factor and setting it equal to 0 so that we put the number negative 4 becoming a positive 4 being on the outside. And then on this one, we were actually given the value to put in itself instead of the x minus 4 um, polynomial, and we knew that we had to put the negative one on the outside. Um, this was our, did we do this one last time? Yeah, okay. Did we? I don't think we did. I was like, I think this is leftover from my other class. Let me cut that out. Okay, so this one is the same kind of problem. Um, it asks the question in a similar way, um, but it doesn't look exactly the same. This one over here asked us to find f of negative 1. This one asks us if negative 1 of a different equation, but if, if negative 1 is a 0. So if negative 1 is a 0 is coming from the question of what happens when I get to the end of one of these problems in the remainder spot. Let me change my colors. So right here at the end when I got the 3, if this had been a 0, like it's asking me on this question, I would have gotten a 0 in that spot right there, and I didn't. So if I didn't, it means that it's not a 0. It's not a factor. It doesn't divide out evenly because I have a remainder left over. So when I'm being asked if something is a 0, I'm being asked to use synthetic division and to evaluate what happens at the end in that remainder spot. So we're going to jump back in today with doing a synthetic division problem. So we're going to put that negative 1 on the outside. And I'm not going to label all of my locations for my powers like I did last time, but you can if it's necessary or helpful to you. I need the power, th the coefficient of the power 3, so that's a 3. The coefficient of the power 2 happens to be a 2. The coefficient of my x term is a negative 2. And then the coefficient at the end all by itself is a negative 1, my constant. If you remember, we drew a line, and then we pulled the first number 3 down. Then we multiplied. The 3 that came down as a 3 gets multiplied by the negative 1 on the outside to give me a negative 3. And then we add. What is 2 plus negative 3? Negative 1. Then I take my negative 1 that I just got, multiply it by the negative 1 on the outside, which will give me a 1. And then I repeat. I add down. Negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. I take again the negative 1, multiply it by the negative 1 on the outside, gives me a 1. And when I add down, what do I get over here? A 0. The question asked, is negative 1 a 0? And the answer is yes, because I got a remainder of 0 at the end. All right? It's equivalent to asking, is 2 um, a factor of 8? And the answer would be yes, because if I take 8 divided by 2, I get remainder 0. But if I had said is 2 a factor of 9, and I do 9 divided by 2, I get a remainder of 1. So the answer is no, it's not a factor. We're doing the same thing here. As I mentioned last time, you can always check to make sure you're right. One of the ways that you can check to do that is you can take the number 1 and you can put it in the place of all the x's to see, do I in fact get a remainder of 0? Do I get a 0 when I do that? If I do, then my synthetic division and my number match up, then I'm good to go. It's a, it's a check step for us. Now, number four is asking, again, a, a very similar question. It's asking, is x plus 5 a factor? Well, we ran into this sort of idea over here at the very beginning when it says we're going to divide by x minus 4, right? And again, if I had had a 0 here at the end, it would have been a factor. It wasn't. So in other words, x minus 4 is not a factor of x squared minus 3x plus 9. And the way that I did that is I first set it equal to 0, and then I solved for x. So we'll do that over here as well. We will take that x plus 5, set it equal to 0, and if I solve that for x, what do I get? Negative 5. So my synthetic division will have a negative 5 on the outside. 
and then I've got each of the coefficients of each of my powers of x. Power of x3 is a coefficient of 1, 8 is the coefficient for x squared, 11 is the coefficient for x, and then I have a negative 20 at the end. I'll draw my line, and I'll bring down my 1. So the first one, 1 times negative 5 is negative 5. What's 8 minus 5? 3. Now I need that 3 times the negative 5. Negative 15. 11 minus 15? Negative 4. Then I need negative 4 times the negative 5 which is 20, and if I add down, what do I get? Zero. So what does this tell me? Yes, it is. x plus 5 is a factor, because when I do the zero or corresponding to it, I get a remainder of zero. Now part B is not just like, oh, and the directions are the same, we're going to do something, it's not like that. It's a continuation from what we did on part A. Um, there have been tests that I have written before that use this same pattern and then people sort of disregard what they did on A and start from scratch. Well, the whole point was to use what you did on A so that you've already got part of it done. Okay, so to factor completely means to take this expression right here, and to create, you know, x plus this, x plus that, 3x plus 7, whatever the numbers are, and to write them all out in their factored form. And the cool thing is, you already have one of them, you have x plus 5. So one of your factors is already done, x plus 5. The other factors come from the quotient right here that came out of the synthetic division. Now we didn't actually write it out, but what you want to remember is that the power goes down by 1. It was x cubed when we started. I've taken out an x when I did the x plus 5. So now this is x squared, and this is x, and this is our constant at the end. So what I still have remaining now is x squared plus 3x minus 4. Well, at that point, it's quadratic. So it'll either factor, or if it doesn't, we can use quadratic formula to find the zeros. This one factors. This is set equal to zero because we're finding zeros in a moment. So I have x plus 5, and this one actually does factor, which was why the directions said to do so. x squared, I need x and x. The negative at the end tells me my signs are different, so I need a negative and I need a positive. I need two numbers that multiply to negative 4 and add to 3. Mm -hmm. Positive 4 and negative 1. That'll do it. So this is the first part of the directions that said factor completely. And the reason I know this is now factored completely is because they're all linear. So remember, what do I mean by linear? It means there's no powers of x. These are all x with a power of 1. That's how I know it's factored completely. The other part of the directions say that it wants me to find all the zeros, right? So that means I take each of those factors and set them equal to zero and solve. So if x plus 5 equals 0, uh, x minus 1 equals 0, and x plus 4 equals 0. So I'll subtract my 5. So 1 is x equal negative 5. I'll add my 1. So x is equal to 1. And I'll subtract the 4. So x is equal to negative 4. Now notice, and we'll talk more about this in section 3.3, 3, but notice this started out as a power of 3, right? And how many answers do I get here at the end? Three. It's not a coincidence. There is sort of a catch to it that we haven't seen happen yet, but that's not a coincidence. Having three zeros is exactly the reason is because it was a power of three polynomial to begin with. Okay, any questions on that one? 
Okay, we're going to shift gears just a little bit. Um, in all of these problems where we're trying to decide if something is a factor, they give us a thing to try, right? They, they gave us something to put out there in that little box. Well, they don't always. So the next part tells us what happens when they don't. Now, first, I should take some back. I was already jumping into the rational zeros theorem. Let me talk about the fundamental theorem of algebra. Uh, the fundamental theorem of algebra says that if p of x is a non-constant function, so that means it's not like p of x equals 7, p of x equals 5, just a constant number. It has variables in it. Then p of x has at least one zero. Um, now, having one zero doesn't mean it crosses the x-axis. It might. Um, but it means it either crosses the x-axis or it has imaginary solutions, one of those two options. So it has some kind of a solution to it. You can set it equal to zero, you can solve, and you will always get some answer, something. It can be imaginary or it could be real. The rational zeros theorem actually talks about how you identify what the rational zeros are. Um, and in particular, for what we're looking at, for the way we're doing synthetic division, it's how you select maybe possible options to put in the box. Because not every number that you put in the box gives you a remainder of zero at the end, obviously. So how do you check? Well, over here, we had the number negative 5 in the box on the outside, and it gave us a zero at the end. But the reality is we could have had any one of these three in that box on the outside, and it would have given me a zero at the end. And anything else I picked wouldn't. Anything. So there's like infinitely many numbers that will not work, right? And there's only three that will. So how do you narrow it down when you don't have a starting point into the, the possible options that will? Well, you use the possible rational zeros theorem. It says that if you take all of the factors of the constant term at the end and all the factors of the leading coefficient from the beginning and you set them up as a ratio, put them that way, the constant terms on top of the leading coefficient terms, those are the only possible numbers that can go in the box and work. So you've taken it from infinitely many options down to a finite number. Yeah, it may be a large finite number, but it is finite. It's not infinite any longer. Now, we are in a very fabulous state of um, affairs because we have calculators that will help us to also narrow that down even further. We won't have infinitely many options because of the passive rational zero theorem, but we also won't have tons of options because we have calculators. So you're going to want your calculator to help you out if you have that with you. I'll show you and talk to you about how you use a graphing calculator to do it and then how you use a calculator if you just have scientific. Graphing is preferable. It eliminates things much quicker, but a scientific one will work too. So grab that out. We'll need that here in just a second. Um, but before we get to needing it, I'm going to talk about how you list out all the different options that you have and sort of make a case for why you want your calculator when you can use it. So here's a function. Here's the value at the beginning, and here's the value at the end, right? The number, the constant term is 15. Um, factors of 15. What numbers divide 15? Okay, 3 and 5. What else? Yep, 1 and 15. So those are the numbers if you put them in order. 3, 5, 1, and 15. Over here on the 8, what are the numbers that divide 8? 2 and 4. What else? Yep, 1 and 8 are missing. So 1, 2, 4, and 8. So this isn't the best case scenario. We're going to see a nicer one later. But it's also not the worst case scenario. Um, maybe it's not worst case, but the number 36 is really bad. Um, and the reason is because it has a lot of factors. Think about all the numbers that divide 36. One, two, three, four. I mean, there's a ton of them, and then you have their counterparts. There's a lot. So the fewer things that divide it, the easier this process is to do. And you still might be looking at it and say, okay, well, there's only, you know, like four numbers in one case and four numbers in the other case. How bad can it be? Well, you're about to see just how bad it can be when there's even just this few. Because what we're doing is we're dividing the P's by the Q's. And again, if you'll remember, the P's are the numbers at the end and the Q's are the numbers at the beginning. So what we're doing is we're taking all of those values of P, which was 1, 3, 5, and 15, and then all the values of Q, which is 1, 2, 4, and 8, 
and we're dividing them by each other, and we can both divide by the positives or the negatives, right? All the positives are possibilities, all the negatives are possibilities. So we're going to list out all the things that could happen. I'm fine with you putting the plus or minus on the outside and then putting a parenthesis. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a number on the top, one at a time, and divide it by a number on the bottom. So one divided by one is one. One divided by two is one half. One divided by four is one fourth. And one divided by eight is one eighth. Is that good so far? That's the number one divided by all possible denominators. Then we go to the next one, three. Three divided by one is three. Three divided by two in a reduced fraction form is three halves. Three divided by four is three fourths. And three divided by eight is three eighths. <coughs> and now we're gonna go to the number five. Five divided by one is five. Five divided by two is five halves. Five divided by four is five fourths. And five divided by eight is five eighths. There's a lot of them, right? We still have the 15. 15 divided by one is 15. 15 divided by two is 15 halves. Now, let me pause right here to say that none of my have duplicated so far. I haven't been able to reduce them. They haven't ended up matching something I already had. If they did, we wouldn't list them again. If they had the ability to reduce, we would reduce them like I'm doing 15 over one is 15. So we're simplifying as we go here. There's just not a lot of simplification on this particular one to do. I have 15 fourths and 15 eighths as I finish up. How many different possible rational zeros do I have? Close. <coughs> Huh? Nope, more than 20. Nope, don't just guess numbers. 32, why is it 32? Right, so I just listed 16 numbers, so those of you who were saying 16, you were counting these, which is great. But there's a positive of each one of those values and a negative of each one of those values, making there 32 possibilities. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to do this 32 times. Yeah, I can tell by your faces you're not interested in that game either, right? This is not a carnival game that we want to play. No, we don't want to do that. We want to be able to use our calculator, and I'll show you how, to be able to eliminate some of those options. Are you with me? And that's what we will be able to do when we have a lot of options. Now, I'd like to do one where we have fewer options first so you can see how it works, and then we'll do one that's more complicated like this. We're going to do this example where I have fewer options first. So if I'm doing the same thing that I just did on this problem and I'm identifying, I don't have as many choices. So what numbers divide two? One and two. And there's a coefficient understood of one here. And what numbers divide one? Well, just itself, one, right? These are my cues. So when I think about listing out my P's over Q's here, I have that plus or minus, but the only numbers I have on top are one and two, and the only numbers I have on bottom are one. So I really do get positive and negative one and two. How many choices do I actually really have here? Four. I have one and negative one, two and negative two. And if I had to do synthetic division four times, I might not be appreciative of the fact that I did it four times, but it would not do me in. 32 might, <laughs> right? Now, I want to show you how you can get to a better place to make a decision about what to try. So I'd like for you to take your calculator. If you have a graphing calculator, I'm going to talk to you, go, you guys first. And if you don't, I'll talk to you guys with scientific ones second. What I'd like for you to take your calculator and do is to put in the original equation that you were given into your graph. So we're just looking at the calculator's version of a graph for this. For those of you who don't have a calculator, I'm gonna put a sketch on the board so that maybe like if you have one and you just don't have it with you, you'll be able to do this later. 
or if you can borrow one for this purposes, you'll know what we're doing here. Um, the basic graph looks like this, approximately, you know, give or take, depending on your scale and so forth. The important point of this graph is actually the location where it's crossing the x-axis. And what you're wanting to do is to look at that and guesstimate what you think it looks like it's doing. Where does it look like, for those of you who are looking at a graph, not my scale on the picture on the screen, but where does it look like it's crossing? It looks like it's crossing at negative one. Our guess is that this is negative one. It's a guess, um, unless you're you know, using some other capabilities of your calculator. It's a guess right now, but it's a pretty good guess. Um, so you can use that negative one on the outside, and that's the most viable option based on the picture we're seeing to try. So we can try negative one. I have one, because that's the x cubed, negative one for x squared. Notice the x is missing, so that's an understood zero coefficient. And then I have the coefficient at the end of two. We'll bring the numbers down. Negative one on the, out, on the first part, I'm sorry, one on the first part. One times negative one is negative one. So it gives me negative two. Negative two times negative one is two. I add down, that gives me two. Negative two times negative, two times negative one gives me negative two, which is zero. It works, right? So if I get to this point then, and I'm told to factor or find, I said this one actually says find all real and complex zeros. I found one of them right there. It's x equals negative one. Fabulous. And then what I've got remaining here corresponds to the, the polynomial x squared minus two x plus two. Bad news. It doesn't factor. It happens. So what is our recourse when something doesn't factor? What do we do when something doesn't factor? This is like audience participation time where you say quadratic formula. Y'all can giggle at me, but nobody's talking. <laughs> All right, we're going to use a quadratic formula. So we have the opposite of b, so negative b, so negative of negative 2 plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is negative 2 squared, minus 4a is 1, and c is 2. All over 2 times a is 1. I have 2 at the beginning, plus or minus. Um, this is 4 minus 8, and it's all over 2. Two plus or minus, so four minus eight is negative four. What's the square root of negative four? Two i, so I have two plus or minus two i over two. What does that simplify to? All these twos? One plus or minus i. Right, one plus or minus i. You can leave it written like that, fine with that. You can just write x equals 1 plus or minus i, or if you want to write them out as 1 plus i and 1 minus i, if that's more um, visibly appealing to you, you can do it that way. Notice again, this was an x cubed polynomial, and how many zeros do I have? Three, right? x was negative 1, x is 1 plus i, x is 1 minus i. All right, we're going to do the same thing. In, oh, I didn't mention what happens if you don't have a graphing calculator, but you still want to use a calculator. Um, what you can actually do, it's a little bit more tedious, but it's better than nothing, is that you can take each one of these one at a time and you can plug them into this equation. Okay, your calculator simplifies the process of doing that quickly to see which one gives you zero as the output, right? So you put in one, you do one cubed minus one squared plus two, press enter, does it equal zero? If it does, that's the number you try. If it not, you do the next one. Exactly. Now, on this one, it was kind of clear which the x-intercept it was. On the next one, it's a little bit more um, fuzzy. So let me show you what I mean. On this one, it's kind of like that first example problem where we looked at the p's and q's. I have 
factors of 1, 2, 7, and 14 for the number 14. And I have that same 1, 3, 5, and 15 for the 15. So there are a ton of options here. Um, so if I'm writing out my P's over Q's like I did previously, I have 1, 2, 7, and, seven, and 14, excuse me, over 1, 3, 5, and 15. Th those are my options. And um, I, again, will divide each of them out. So 1 divided by 1, 1 divided by 3, 1 divided by 5, 1 divided by 15. 2 divided by 1 is 2, 2 divided by 3, 2 divided by 5, 2 divided by 15. Um, 7 divided by 1, 7 divided by 3, 7 divided by 5, and 7 divided by 15. And then I have 15, 14, sorry. 14 divided by 1 is 14, 14 divided by 3, 14 divided by 7, not 7, 5, and 14 divided by 15. These are all my options, and there are, again, 32 of them. So this is actually me showing you how it really helps. Like over here, yeah, it helped, but 4 was not awful. Here it helps a lot because 32 is awful. So we do the same thing, put it in your calculator, let's look at a graph, and I'll sketch what I've got on the screen so that we can all take a look. 15x to the third minus 37x squared plus 44x minus 14. And the graph is actually really kind of weird looking. It almost looks like it's a line, kind of like this. Not very good. Kind of looks like that. Um, again, what I'm interested in is where it's crossing the x-axis. So while it may not be the best, you know, like pleasing visually graph ever, what it does tell you is it doesn't cross on the negative side, right? It's only crossing on the positive side here. So what does that mean? Well, it means that I just cut my 32 possible answers down to 16 because I don't need to try anything that's negative from what I'm seeing. So everybody makes sense with that part. That's a good news. I don't have a plus or minus. I only have the pluses. So I'm down to 16 options. And I still don't want to do 16 different choices. Now, if you look at your calculator, it actually looks like the answer is somewhere between 0 and 1. Okay? So the only viable options for me to try are my numbers that are between 0 and 1. Now, that's still quite a few of them, but it eliminates some things. For example, that's not a 7, that's not a 2, and that's not a 14. Those numbers are all bigger than 1. Um, it's also not 7 thirds or 7 fifths or 14 thirds or 14 fifths because those are all bigger than 1. So I, I'm sort of you know, winnowing it down as I go. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. There's 8 choices left. I've cut it in half again. Now, if we look a little bit more carefully, it looks very much like it's about half, like if you zoomed in, it looks like it's about halfway in between. Now, one half is not an option on my list, right? So I don't want to try one half because that's not going to work. I want to try something that's in my list, but something that's close to one half. So can you identify for me any values that you think are close to one half in this list? Two thirds is pretty close. Seven fifteenths is pretty close. And I would contend that two-fifths is pretty close. Everything else is quite a bit further away. I mean, you might say one-third. I think you could probably go with that one. So again, we've cut it in half to four options. This is where you would do the same thing that you would do if you had a scientific calculator. I still don't want to try four things, right? So you'd plug them into the values. So you'd take one-third and you'd do... 15 times 1 third cubed minus 37 times 1 third squared plus 44 times 1 third minus 44 minus 14. Not ideal, perhaps, um, but your calculator can do that really quick. We don't want to do that because that's fractions and powers and so forth, but the calculator can do it really quickly. So I'm going to sort of spoil all your fun to tell you what the number is. The number that actually will end up giving you zero if you test it and try it 
is actually 7 over 15. Because what I want you to do is to see what happens when we use like a fractional value in the outside corner. So I'm going to write this on this other screen. We're going to have a 7 over 15 in my corner on the outside. My original equation that I was working with here was h of x equals 15x cubed minus 37x squared plus 44x minus 14. So those are the coefficients that are going to go in my synthetic division. So I have 15, negative 37, 44, and negative 14. So synthetic division, we pull the first number down, it's 15. And beautiful things are about to happen. What happens when you multiply 15 by 7 fifteenths? You get 7. What's negative 37 plus 7? Negative 30. Now, it's not quite as obvious, but it's still very nice. What is negative 30 times 7 fifteenths? Yeah, it's 14. And I think it's negative, right? Yeah, negative 14. What's 44 minus 14? That would be 30. Much like the negative 30 I had before. So when I multiply 30 times 7 15, this time I get a positive 14. And lo and behold, what happened? Zero. zero. Yay, we got a zero at the end. Fantastic. Now, that tells us that this is one of my zeros, right? 7 over 15. It also tells us that this is the other polynomial. It's 15x squared minus 30x plus 30. Again, it's one power less. That's why it's x squared. But what do you notice about all those terms? Thank you. They're divisible by 15. So we don't want to work with anything that would do quadratic formula or factoring when we can take out a constant term. And because it's a number, you can actually divide both sides by it. And you end up getting, getting x squared minus 2x plus 2 equals 0. We would try to factor. We would find out that it doesn't. We would have to use the quadratic formula. We're not going to. And the reason we're not is because we already did this problem. We already did x squared minus 2x plus 2. So I really just wanted to change the problem a little bit to show you what happens with the 7 fifteenths and how to eliminate values, not finish the problem out in a different way. So at the very end, let me just write this, that we already did this. So since we already did this before, we're sort of cheating. It's not cheating, but it feels like it. We actually got that this is x plus or x equals one plus i and x equals one minus i.